Good morning, wherever you are in Australia, and welcome to Handling Customers on the Phone. I'll just stop my share for a second so you can see who I am. G'day, I'm Don Tyson James, and I'll be taking you through this thanks to Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program in conjunction with Regional Development Australia, Brisbane in Queensland, and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory. Let's share that screen. And let's get underway with a nice little guy that's not going to be hopefully too scary and too hard to apply to your particular small business. And this is designed very much for small businesses. We're not talking about you being a great big giant corporation. We're not asking you to be you know, so professional that is indistinguishable from a big box retailer. We're just looking at ways to more effectively use a phone to help your business to do a little bit better at that. If you have anything like mine, um, I've struggled with the phone for a long time. I was a very early adopter of digital chat and, and the ability to be able to SMS and all that. So the phone is not very, despite my age, the, fo the phone doesn't come naturally to me. It's something which I have to force myself to learn, put systems in place and understand that there's a little bit more to it than just simply picking up a phone and making a call. First of all, a quote from Simon Sinek, who's a very, very famous motivational slash thought leader, futurist kind of person. Does the emails get reactions? Phone calls start conversations. It's a bit of a thought as we move forward. It understands that phone calls are very much about a two-way conversation that's happening at the time. So that's what makes it feel a little bit scarier than an email conversation where you broadcast, they respond, they broadcast to you, you respond, and it's very, very clean and easy to do. Interactions on the phone can get messy, but the good news is that a phone call, even though it may, you know, you may have experiences where it's turned into a confusing mess of misunderstandings and miscommunications, it actually has the potential to get long processes and complicated issues sorted so much more quickly because of that instant feedback that you got with a conversation where you can be clearly understood by the other person, the customer then can be clearly understood and the issues and problems can be identified very, very quickly and then put to rest as quickly as possible as well. Let's move on. If you'd like to watch this again later, you can watch it on YouTube through the Business Station channel. Just search on youtube.com, search for business station, or even look for my name and you'll be able to find this particular uh, thing a little bit later on today. It should be loaded up and ready to go. What we're going to look at today is a brief look at how to start an outbound call or answer an inbound call. They're the basics we're looking at. They're the things that are really going to help you to establish that call in, a, in the best possible way, whether it's coming to you or whether you're Sorry, I had something in my mouth that shouldn't be there. Oh, it was terrible. How to put people on hold without making them feel abandoned. This is such an important skill that I wish so many more businesses would be able to learn because it makes us feel like crap when we're left holding on a line for so long. And I'm not talking about when you call up a call center and they put you on a queue. I'm talking about when they've already answered your call and then you've got to sit in a queue waiting for them to get back to you. And there's also how to... Listen to what your customer is really saying, getting behind the ideas of how they're communicating, how it's different to the way that you may communicate and giving you a chance to be able to reconcile what they want with what you need. And so you can create a better customer service experience all over. And of course, we want to look um, at ways to help your customer feel like they're really well understood they're really well listened to, but at the same time, so you understand that you are well understood by them and you can feel listened to and validated in that call as well. It's not just about the customer, it's also about you a little bit too. A little bit about me, I'm Don Tayson James, I'm an ASBAS Digital Solutions Advisor, uh, have been now for nearly three years as part of this program, delivering webinars, workshops, and one-to-one -one advisory solutions through the program in the Northern Territory, Western Australia and Queensland as well. I'm also a Facebook community trainer for Facebook Australia and New Zealand. They send me all around the country to be able to train businesses just like yours in how to be more effective users of the Facebook family of apps. I work with Google's digital springboard program as well, delivering their particular materials all around the country, usually by webinar, but sometimes we do some really interesting um, processes and really interesting workshops in remote and regional areas all over Australia. I'm also 
sip that coffee so the throat's getting dry already. I'm an owner of three small business, including my own digital marketing agency called Clickstarter. So that's uh, a bit of background about me. I'm sure you have a whole lot of story to tell as well. But how about we get underway with the material that's going to get you there? Because we want to know how to get those phone calls happening better. But first, we need to understand the context of the world we live in. And the world we live in has 64% of customers preferring to deal with businesses by things other than phone calls. So whether it's messenger chat or it could be SMS or email, 64% of customers prefer to deal with us not using the phone. That's now the majority. It's not just Generation X. It's not just Generation Y, Z and millennials. It's across the board. Where we don't have to deal with people uh, via direct conversation seems to be where we're heading towards. So whilst that's still, a, that, whilst that is definitely a thing and whilst that is definitely a trend, there's still the rest of that, that, that 56% or 46% who are still operating by phone. And they're still like, every time you call any kind of call center, you're going to go on hold. You're going to wait in a queue. That shows you that there's still plenty of people who need to resolve things via the phone. And let's face it, if you're getting nowhere in a text conversation or a chatbot conversation or through emails backwards and forwards, you're still gonna have to make that call or at least going to a branch or going to a store to get that problem of yours resolved if there's a problem that needs to be resolved. 72% of that 64% say it's because they don't want to be given a sales spiel from the person on the other end. What that's done is because we're being damaged so badly from other calls we've received or other calls we've had to make before, we just go, you know what? It's no place calling these people because all get is a sales spiel and they won't want to listen to what I have to say anyway. Less than 1% of Australians, this is pretty damning, list working in a call center as a desirable job. Now, there's a lot of Australians who do work in call centers, but less than 1% of Aussies reckon it's a good place to work. That goes to show you that our relationship with a phone is very, very complicated. The way we deal with the phone, the way we feel about dealing with the phone, the way that we approach going into conversations on the phone, we've got a very complicated relationship with it in that we just don't really want to deal with it if we don't have to. And there's reasons for this. 50 years of unsolicited telemarketing phone calls, that would probably have something to do with it. I know that I'm very shy about answering phone calls, especially from people I don't know. If I see a number come up from Sydney or Melbourne, I'm now assuming that that number is not actually from um, a business. It's not from someone I know. It's from a telemarketer. And the few times I've ever answered calls from Sydney and Melbourne numbers, they have exactly been telemarketing calls. I don't know where they get them from. I don't know how to get through, but I'll tell you what, I've done the do not call register and they still keep on coming. So I report these numbers as I can, but unfortunately these people are not based in Sydney or Melbourne. They're buying phone numbers that exist in Sydney and Melbourne. So that's actually making the do not call register a complete waste of time. On Monday, I received 16 unsolicited phone calls from unlisted mobile numbers. These are phone numbers I could not look up and find online that, that belong to anyone. They're not people that I recognized. There was just this like, long string of calls from mobile numbers. And I'm like, I don't know who these people are. I didn't answer them. They didn't leave messages. So I'm assuming again, telemarketers, they're wrecking things. And then there's what I call the wrecking ball effect. Now the wrecking ball effect is that the, the, when the phone call comes through to you, it's like a wrecking ball coming smashing through your day. You weren't expecting it to come. You weren't expecting it to happen. It just appeared. It just sort of happened in your day. And next thing you knew, you were having to take a phone call because you're a business. And let's face it, that's where a lot of business can come from is through phone calls, right? So that wrecking ball effect actually also then makes us very shy about making phone calls. It, it puts us in a position where we feel quite a lot of anxiety about making a call to someone because we know how we feel when someone calls us out of the middle of nowhere. It's an interruption. It's exactly that wrecking ball effect. We don't want to be the wrecking ball. And so this little self-perpetuating cycle builds on itself where we don't like the wrecking ball wrecking our day. We don't want to be the wrecking ball wrecking anyone else's day. And so we retreat to our emails and to our SMS and to our Facebook messenger. And we just sort of reach out there. 
Of course, if you've ever answered a phone call from an angry customer, you know that angry customers can be something which is really, really um, creates a lot of anxiety around people. It's the greatest fear that anyone working in a call center will have until they build up some what I call call calluses around it. They get the opportunity over a period of time to build up, I guess, a, a resistance to that. So it's just like, for instance, if you um, have anything in your life where you go exercising, for instance, you grow a muscle around that exercise. So too, when it comes to angry customers and aggressive people on the other end of the phone, you do build up some resistance to that. You build up some muscle around that. So you know how to handle that. And you know that when they're coming in like a really swinging and angry and, and wanting to sort of, you know, pull down the world and burn all the bridges that you've actually in a position to make a really big difference, not just in their life, but to the actual nature of that call. And of course, social anxiety is a very real thing. It's something which has popped up very heavily in the last 10 years in this generation of uh, millennials and gener generation, uh, generation Z, uh, younger people under the age of 35. We're looking at really heavy social anxiety. The idea of talking to someone you don't know on disembodied voice on the phone kind of creeps them out a little bit, to be honest. Now, these are people who will meet up with strangers on Tinder. They'll have strangers bring food to their door. When it comes to forging a relationship with someone in a business sense, my throat is very dry today. The air con is a bit too high, I think. And um, they, they've they developed this real anxiety around the ability to be able to conduct a phone call, whether they're the one who's starting the phone call or whether they're the one who's answering it. In fact, there's some statistic that showed that over 70% of people under the age of 30 have extreme anxiety when it comes to a phone ringing from a number they don't recognize. I can relate to that a little bit. I'm a little bit out of that age range, quite a lot out of that age range to be sure. But I understand the anxiety that comes with a phone number that you don't recognize and feeling forced to answer it. It does make you feel like, you know, there's, there's some way that you've got to deal with this, but you don't feel like you can. The way to beat this fear and this anxiety is to turn this whole phone thing into a bit of a system, into a bit of a process and understanding that there's, key processes and there's key ideas and, and, and lots of little tips and tricks that will make it so much more pleasant and so much less scary. And as I've made more and more business phone calls and answered more and more business phone calls, it's no longer the greatest fear of my small businesses. It's now something which I can do. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. I'm never going to like or enjoy them, but I've started to actually be able to be effective with them. You don't have to like everything about what you do in business, but you do have to be effective with everything in your small business. And this is where I think that we can start to build that muscle. So let's get underway and cover off what it takes to make better calls, much better calls start with confidence. Your tone of voice is going to convey an idea that you can be trusted. It's going to convey an idea that someone is safe dealing with you. The idea that you have a solution to the problem they're coming in with. If they come in there and you don't sound very confident, you don't answer the phone in a confident manner, or you don't start the phone call in a confident manner, means that they're going to feel like you know, they can't trust you and they can't trust you. They just want to get the phone call over and done with as soon as humanly possible. Why? Because basically you don't seem like someone who's offering them anything that can make their lives better. We only answer the phone to unsolicited phone calls and actually engage with a conversation when it's something that is something in it for us or there's something in it for someone like us to be able to take advantage of. Now, knowing your product and knowing your services makes a huge difference in every call center I've ever seen. And I worked in a couple of call centers for telecommunications companies when I was in university back in the 90s. <laughs> Gives you an idea of my age. Knowing your product and service was such a core area of where we had to show that confidence, I suppose. If you know your product and you believe in your product and you know the value of your product, then it's not hard to be able to then convey that across to someone and feel confident about what you're dealing with. If you're working in a call center for a company whose product you don't believe in, you may need to actually look at working for a different company. We don't always get that choice. And if it's your own business, you even more so 
should believe in and know your product and know your service. There's something about calling up you know, a, a spare parts dealer and asking for a very specific part and they know what you're talking about. Or you're calling up a craft store and you're asking for a very specific gauge of knitting needle and they know what you're talking about because they know their product, they know the service, they know the value. And because they know it so well, they're easily able to inspire confidence in you as the person who's calling them to find out about a very specific detail about that product or service set. One of the ways you could actually get around that is to have reference materials nearby. Now, the guys who answer the phone call at Telstra don't necessarily have like a wall of references around them or a big manual. They have systems that are able to look questions up. They're able to look up the most frequently asked questions. They can look up your account details so that they can see what the history is so they can get some context for where this call might need to go. So likewise, you can have systems that help you out with that, but you're more likely going to have, you know, rate sheets, you might have parts lists, you might have a book full of these things, or even your website. If your website lists all your products and services, it can be really useful for you to have your website up at the same time as you're taking that call on a headset or on headphones or even just putting it on a loudspeaker. Most of my calls I do these days are on loudspeaker because the, the microphone, excuse me, the microphones are a lot more capable of doing these these days. They're a lot more capable of being able to handle these kind of conversations more clearly, especially if you're in a quiet place. And I'm in a closed office space where the only noise is the air conditioner and the guys working on the roof at the other end of the building. Thankfully, this week, last week, I had a call that I had to do lots of calls and webinars and, and Zoom calls with people working literally above me with drills in the ceiling. It wasn't the best capable, it wasn't the most capable day, let's put it that way. You could always start with a script or at least a bunch of dot points. And that's what I was talking about with having your website there in front of you or some notes around you or a book that's got all the information in it. If you start with that kind of thing, it at least gives you points on where the conversation might go. It at least gives you points you can bring back or easy reference to an, a quick, simple question that's asked from that customer when they're calling you. Confidence, of course, though, is not the only thing. It's also to do with the tone of voice you're using. So if you practice sounding natural as you can be on a phone call, you eventually will be natural on a phone call. One of those great things I learned about when I was working in commercial radio is that the tone of voice you use when you're on the radio is not natural. The way that people talk when they're in a comedy show is not natural. The way that people are talking on webinars like I am right now is not natural. This is not my conversational presentation voice. This is a much more clear, much more um, measured way of communicating because this is one way communication. I'm trying, my objective isn't to make you uh, necessarily like me. My objective here is to help you to learn a new skill. So there's certain techniques I use to ensure that the information gets in and sticks enough so you can walk away and go, I'm glad I did that course. I learned something today. But in a natural conversation on a phone, that the sing-song nature of it or the little bits of pauses and emphasis points that I'm using as I'm describing what we're going to do in a webinar isn't really going to help on a phone. In fact, it sounds a little bit weird and sounds a little bit tossy. So when you practice sounding natural, it's something you can do with another person. Before you start making calls, before you start you know, making outbound calls particularly, you may want to practice this with someone else and just go, okay, do 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 call... Um, role plays. Now, I know role plays, everyone hates them. I know everyone hates them. I hate them too. But they really help you when it comes to phone calls because you're getting another person's input onto your performance in that role play. The idea of that other person giving you that input is to ensure that they can catch you when you're going into radio announcer mode. Because let's face it, not everybody talks like this when they're talking on the phone to somebody that they are trying to help out with a service inquiry. See, that's that's radio announcer talk. That might work on Hot 100. It might work on 97.3 FM. It might work on, you know, whatever your local radio station happens to be. But that's not the way that people communicate naturally. So it's going to feel forced. It's going to feel unnatural. 
And you hear it when people are calling out radio stations. They hear that the announcer going on a little bit like that as well. Cassie from Caranda, what are you thinking about today? And that person's like, uh, this is weird. It doesn't feel natural because it's not natural. It's forced. What you want to do is practice with another person to make sure that the flow of conversation feels natural. It doesn't feel like you're a radio announcer who's trying to, or a teacher like I'm trying to do, trying to put forward um, concepts to other people that are not quite right. And they're not quite, um, I, I want this, the purpose of this is for me to teach. Um, the purpose of a conversation on the phone is to hear both sides of the story and negotiate some kind of understanding between the two parties. Taking breath breaks and slowing down is a massive one. Now, this is something where I've had to learn it over a period of years, and I still have to remind myself I'm doing it. About two minutes ago, I had to pick up my coffee cup and drown out a yawn. What happens is that I tend to talk so fast that I don't take breath breaks. And when I don't take a breath break, my body says, take a yawn to force me to take that breath break. Like... I put my coffee cup in front of me so it makes it feel like I'm a little less rude. So that's a little nervous tick that I have. I talk too fast. I don't take breath breaks. And I do this thing where I slouch forward a little bit to get closer to the camera to force emphasis. And it crushes the, the lung area and makes it harder for me to retain a lot more oxygen in my system. That's a physiological thing that comes across on a phone call. So if you're not taking those breath breaks, if you're not taking your time to describe things in a calm and measured way, your tone is going to feel like it's motor mouthing, it's going like this. Oh, I'd like to tell you that today. Um, let's, uh, let me read through the three things that are really, really popular about this particular phone service. First of all, the first thing you're going to, and you start to get really puffed, that kind of thing is frantic and people are going to hang up that phone as soon as they possibly can, walking away and going, Oh my God, I have no idea what that person was talking to because all I heard was blah, 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 blah. You don't want to be that person. Listening is a vital skill. And I like the old proverb that we we're born with, you know, two ears and one mouth. So we should be using them proportionately by listening twice as much as we're talking. A bit different for me today because I'm on a webinar and I'm presenting something. But in the case of a phone call, it's going to be a little different. There needs to be listening for questions before you offer your opinions on stuff. Now, for instance, if you're running through the features and benefits of your particular service or your particular product, then it's very easy to start offering what your opinions are about those products as well. But you have to really give a chance for the customer to respond. We have a $22 a month webinar plan that I think will be great for you doesn't actually give someone a chance to go whether this is good for them. That's just trying to force them into a $22 a month plan by automatically associating it with them. What it could be is that, hi, we've got three different kind of plans for you. There's a $22 plan, which features A, B, and C. There's a $27 plan, which features all that same stuff plus these three extras. And then there's the $44 a month plan. Now it's a bit of a jump up, but that's because it's got unlimited data and it's got a brand new phone that was sent to you as well. So it covers the rental of that phone. Um, do any of those sound like they may be of interest? And then you can listen, listen to the response, see what it is that someone's going for. They may ask you to repeat one of those options or to repeat something about it. So you get the idea of what's important to the customer. It could be price. In some many customers, it could be a price, but in many more customers, it's not about price at all. It's about the fine points, the details they may have missed as you were talking through the deal. So if you're listening for what those things are that they didn't quite get, giving them some options to jump in and ask a question, you're then learning enough about them to be able to customize all the conversation you're having from this point forward with them in a certain direction that helps them come to the best conclusion for themselves. Now, this could be if it's a sales call. This could be if it's an inquiry coming in on the phone. What you want to do is listen for the problems faced by the customer. And by problems, I'm not talking about, you know, the problems with their family relationships, their problems with their car. 
We're talking about the issues related to the product or the service that you're presenting. Let's just say that you are a consultant doing a coaching position. So you want to do a little bit of life coaching, energy healing, that kind of thing where you're um, bringing a service into that customer's life that's there to solve a specific problem they have. But once you start going to, here's all my solutions and you haven't actually heard of what the problem is, you're missing mark. They're, they're, they're right here and you're trying to shoot there. It's, you're not actually meeting them at the point where they have a problem to be solved. You're just preempting and assuming what that problem may happen to be. Which also, I guess, brings me to the next point about assumptions, that we tend to try in our heads to finish the sentences that the customers are saying in our heads, rather than listening to what those questions and those problems may be. We go, oh, I'm a mum with three children. So we assume, oh yeah, your life must be really, really, really complicated and you must be so tired all the time. What we don't know is that that mum has really good systems in place that she's actually able to cover everything she needs to cover. And she's also working full time. And as a CEO of a company, she may have staff to help her to be able to look after the kids and help her with the home life. We don't know the full situation unless we're listening for what her full situation is. Wouldn't you like to be in that position where you've got people to look after your kids and people to pick up your laundry and people to wash your dishes? I've got laundry on at the moment because I'm working from home and just came back from a four-day trip in the state. I'd love it if I had cleaners. I'd love it if I had someone to do the laundry for me, right? So you don't finish the sentences for them because every customer is unique. Yes, I'm sure you probably dealt with lots of customers who may be similar in some way. They may have attributes that are quite similar. They might have, you know, they might all be women or they might all be men of a certain age, or they might be people who are working in a small business or people who are changing their career and their lifestyle and they need something to you know, sort of give them an idea of how to move forward. Whatever that is, you've got to assume that this person you're speaking to is not one of the people who fit into your preconceived categories. This is a unique individual with their own backstory, a unique individual with their own life path, a unique individual with their own likes and hates and dislikes. They may have kids. They may not have kids. They may live in the country, the city, the suburbs, in a high-rise apartment. You cannot be making assumptions on their behalf until they've actually communicated those attributes to you. And then you can start to go, okay, now I've got a picture of what your life is like. I can gear my conversation, gear my solution towards you particularly. But if you're just launching into a phone call and just going, here's all my products, here's all my services, sign here and I'll send you the PDF and you can sign it. You're not actually delivering a service that matches what that person may be looking for. In all likelihood, that person may not be looking for what you provide. They may have thought that was the case, but they may not be looking for it. If you're trying to force that sale out of someone who does not match what your products and services are, you're creating a very unhappy customer. You may be able to trick them or convince them into buying the thing you do, but if they don't match it, if it doesn't solve the problem they came to you with, then they're just going to be unhappy. That's going to lead to poor reviews. And let's face it, angry calls of people saying, you know what? I got talked into this. Um, I want my money back. You don't want to be faced with that kind of situation, which also means don't not interrupting or talking over the top of people. I have a colleague. I'm just going to call her um, Janet. Now, Janet uh, is fairly new to one of the businesses that I consult for, and she's got she's a lovely girl. She's absolutely gorgeous. She's just a, a real ray of sunshine and all that. But in her desire to be liked and understood and and to be feel like she's part of the group and the team, she tends to interrupt and talk over people because she gets excited when she's got something in common with them. So, for instance, you say, I really like the West Coast Eagles. Oh, my God, I love the West Coast Eagles. I just went to three West Coast Eagles games last year and my boyfriend took me. And the next thing you know, it's like, wow, I wasn't going down that path. I wasn't really interested in hearing about your experience with the West Coast Eagles, but... Thanks for that, mate. <laughs> so, but we've all come across them. People who um, they, they feel the need to pick up on this one thing that they have in common with you and then they just take off with it and it becomes their conversation, not your conversation. And you feel like you, number one, haven't been listened to. Number two, haven't been understood. And number three, they've just made a broad assumption about you as a customer and as a business that isn't necessarily true. I might say, I love the West Coast Eagles, but my heart is always going to be with Collingwood. So if that's 
when she goes off on a, on a West Coast Eagles tangent by interrupting, then she's actually creating a really awkward moment when you go, well, actually, I was going to say that you know, I love the West Coast Eagles because that's where my family is from, but my heart's always going to be with Collingwood. And she's like, oh, wow, that was a really awkward interruption. Sorry about that. So when you do that sort of thing, you're creating really, really awkward moments that just aren't cool. Maintaining an interesting conversation is where you're avoiding filler words. And by filler words, I mean when you're trying to talk so fast, it's um, uh, um, uh, yeah, all those sort of filler things that you put in when you're not quite sure of what your next words are going to be. Now, this happens usually because we're motor mouthing. We're talking so fast, we're going ahead of where our brain's at. So our brain's sort of over there in that direction and we're trying to catch up with lots of words to fill it up to get to that point. Other words can be things like obviously or clearly. And the example you would use for this would be, uh, we're having a conversation about, uh, let's just say, I was using R then, oh my goodness, because I didn't have the words ready. See what I mean? You will notice the R's and the arms and the clearly's and the obviously's when they come up all the time. <laughs> and when you're very aware of them, they become so annoying with the other person. So as we get back to this example, we could be talking about, yes, phone plans. So those phone plans will be from the person saying, what does the $44 plan include? And if we start up with, well, obviously it includes all the other things that were in the lower price plans. So clearly it offers more things on top of that. What we're doing is actually being kind of condescending that clearly and obviously is making an assumption the person understood that in the first place. And if they didn't understand that in the first place, what tends to happen is that you're assuming not through your assumption that they're dumb, but they feel like, oh, this person must think I'm an absolute idiot. These are filler words that we just drop into conversations because we don't really know where to go with the conversation. We haven't really been listening to the person at the other end. So we're dropping extra words in that give us a brain break. They give us the opportunity to go, okay, what's that next word I'm going to say? What was the next word that was coming? Um, and then the R's and the arms and the obviously and the clearly and you hear it a lot in very young radio announcers who are very new to radio or into television where they're filling and sports uh, personalities, people who are being interviewed after a football game or after a tennis match or after a netball match will often be filled with lots of these filler words the, and they're not interesting conversations. It's usually like, oh, the team will sort of come together at the day, but obviously, you know, that we're the better team on the day and we lost and clearly we need some work to do. You start to see it's just filler talk. It's just nothing committed. There's nothing interesting about that. It becomes really boring. This is where examples come in. Examples can be a great way of connecting the, what the customer is after and what you are trying to offer. So if you can use an example that matches the kind of person you're talking with on the phone. If it's, let's say, for instance, not Janet this time, I'm going to go for someone different, Ken. Ken is looking for a solar panels on his home. He doesn't really know much about solar panels and you have lots of deals when it comes to installing solar panels, uh, solar battery power storage systems, and the, all the connectivity that comes with that. In this case, what you can do is use examples of other homes that you've installed similar systems to for people who are just like Ken. Once you've actually listened, you've not made the assumptions, you know an idea of who Ken is, what the situation is with his home, whether he lives in a place that gets ample sunshine or whether he owns the home at all, you've got the idea of bringing out to go, well, Ken, I once worked with a guy called David who lived you know, probably about three suburbs away from you. He had very similar issues where you'd have a very high pitched roof but that's okay because high pitched roofs can actually be quite efficient for installing solar panels on and they're not dangerous at all. You may think that, yeah, they'll slide off, but the way that solar panels are affixed to your roof means they're not really going to slide off. If you're in an area with lots of snow, well, that might be an issue and that's why the roofs are so high pitched, but you've also got that problem in winter where your solar panels are really not going to be doing much work and working at low efficiency because there's less sun around and a lot more cloud cover. So you can match that example, expand on that example to be something which is relevant to Ken, not just what was relevant to David. And you have an example that then paints the picture for that customer of how your service matches what their problem or expectation actually is. And this one will come up a lot, slowing down and considering the words you're using. 
That brings also another point, which is something I struggle with a lot in webinars because they go on for quite a long time. When I sort of slow myself down and I get my posture right, um, I can decide whether I'm going to sit down or stand up for a phone call or for a webinar for that matter. Now, for webinars, I have to sit down because the positioning of all my cameras and the positioning of my computers so I can read what I'm going to present is very vital for me to sit down. If I stood up, you'd be watching my belly button right now. And I don't know how fascinating that would be. Choosing to sit down or stand up in your phone calls will be what you're most comfortable with. For me, for phone calls, standing up and walking around is the most comfortable way simply because that's the way in which I am much more focused on that phone call. It takes me away from my desk where email and notifications and Facebook Messenger and my other phones are sitting and trying to interrupt me. In fact, they're all trying to do it now. I'm going to turn away all my phones over so I can concentrate and focus because there's lots of notifications coming through, lots of missed calls already, and people are contacting me on LinkedIn. I can hear it coming up on there. It's, it's so much going on that I need to stand up and walk away to do phone calls. It helps me to better have an energy that matches what the customer is trying to get. But once you start that, that walking around, try not to change your position or your posture during the call, because what that does, it, it creates a problem where you have different energy during the call. You may start off with that walking around energy, or you may have a different something different where you're having that sit down energy, where the energy may be just a slight bit lower. But if you're going up and down and up and down and up and down, it's creating an unstable fit for the phone call. Someone may think that, wait, this guy's a bit crazy. He's sort of up and down, he's in and out. I don't know whether, if he's this busy and if he's this you know, frantic on the phone, imagine what they're going to be like to work with. Slouching and leaning forward restricts your breathing. I was saying to you before that I often get this because I lean forward a lot to the camera. If I just take my time to bring my camera down a little bit, sit back in my chair so that my whole body is stretched out a bit, my breathing isn't anywhere near as restricted. In fact, it's much clearer. I don't tend to get that yawny thing which my body's trying to catch up. When I talk about yawning, yeah. bet you I just made um, all of you on the call just yawn as well then. So what you do is you create a posture and a position that allows you to talk clearly. You create a posture and a position that allows you to breathe. So you don't get those yawny moments. You don't get those moments where you're trying to catch your breath because you're trying to say so much. And the other point is too, that you won't get as much of a sore throat. Now, if you do a lot of talking, I do a lot of talking all day on webinars, on Zoom calls, on phone calls, your clients, catching up with clients, going out to coffee with clients. As you correct your posture and sort of get up a bit straighter, a little thing happens where your diaphragm is engaged. And when your diaphragm is engaged, you project your voice so much more clearly so that people can hear you so much more clearly. Your words tend to enunciate a lot better. You're not cutting off your words anywhere near as much because you've got the breath to be able to carry through to the end of the sentence rather than rush, 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 rush. <sighs> Take a breath, rush, 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 rush. It's just a manic way to do it. So if you do that posture thing, if you start, try to stop that slouching forward when you're taking phone calls, particularly if you're like me, you've got a bit of a belly, that slouching forward really does restrict the amount of airflow you've got. And that's going to be heard on a phone call. You're going to sound constantly out of breath. So by slowing down and getting that posture right, you're going to be in a much better position to be able to make and receive those phone calls. But... In every phone call you'll get, you'll be having to prepare yourself for when things are slightly different, when the customer's expectations may not be quite where you match, where you thought they would be. And this is where you need to prepare for objections, prepare for the little hurdles that pop up between what you want to sell them and maybe what it is that they're looking to buy. So when we're preparing for objections, we're looking for some sort of match between your point being explained and them understanding that point. Now, objections can be where you need to be able to explain your point nice and clearly without appearing irritated. So if you're going that call being really irritated, if you're going that call thinking, oh, this person is right my day, oh my God, I've got so much work to do. You've got to snap out of that. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes to snap out of it, I must admit, but sometimes that's just like simply just go, 
taking the deep breath, pick out the phone and answering it. So you've got a defined change between what you were doing and what the thing is that you're going to be doing now. Now, understand that if you're making an outbound call or returning a call to a potential customer to whom you're talking about your products and your services, they will be skeptical. They've heard it all before. They've been put into Facebook sales funnels. They've you know, had webinars with sales experts. They have talked to people at Telstra. They've talked to people at Vodafone. They've talked to people at Aussie Broadband. They've talked to all kinds of people who've had a sales spiel to get through and a limited time with which to handle that call because call centers are generally marked on the outcome of the call being achieved in the shortest time possible. The problem with that is, though, that people don't get to work past that skepticism. They'll just go, well, yeah, I'm shopping around, so yeah, I'll call back if I want to go forward. That's not helpful. That's not helpful to you who is trying to get a sale done in that particular call. So what you may need to do is have a very good understanding in that. And if they're shopping around on what your brand does that others don't, what your business has that other businesses that do the same thing as you, don't seem to deliver. What is your, and we call it unique selling proposition. What is the one thing if they lined up all the companies that do what you do that makes you stand out? And there's usually about three or four different things that you're very unique in. It's not, oh yeah, we're open seven days. Oh yeah, we've got good customer service. It's specific examples of a thing that you do that the others just don't do or the combination that you do that others just don't have that combination. So start off with, not being irritated when you answer that call or when you go into the call, give yourself a nice delineated you know, gap between what you were doing and what you are doing. For me, it's a deep breath. Pick up the phone and answer it. So it allows me to go, I am moving from one thing into another thing. What I was doing before, I need to forget that for now. I need to focus 100% down the barrel on this particular call or this particular task. Understand that they're going to be a little skeptical about what you're offering because they think it's going to be a sales spill. But understand then also that to break through that skepticism of, oh, yeah, it's another person trying to sell me the same thing that all the other people are trying to sell me. By understanding how your brand is different and understanding the difference between you and your competitors helps you to be prepared for when people do object to what your offer may be, whether it's a price objection, a service objection, or just the fact that they may never have heard of you and you're an unknown quantity in the market. One thing we need to do for phone calls though, and I need to do this a lot better for my webinars too, is to prepare my space. So with a webinar, for instance, I will prepare my space by turning on two lights behind me. What that does is it creates a good balance of light from my ring light in front of me, which highlights my face and makes me able to be viewed clearly on a screen, but also highlight the wall. So there's slightly different colors, like a yellow light on one, a white light on this side, yellow light on that side. So they've got this sort of balance of colors that's not too distracting and certainly not having people looking at what's in the background, what's that plant in the background, what's that sign in the background, keeping it nice and plain, but with a little bit of texture that makes it right. I also make sure that usually I turn over my phones so that I can't see all the distracting messages that are coming in and notifications that are being delivered to my phone. This may be the same that you need to do for your workspace when it comes to taking and receiving calls or making outbound calls as well. Decluttering your desk and clearing your space is so important. I do this every week is just get rid of stuff. At the moment, I've got so much stuff. I've got about 30 business cards. I've got a Explore the Red Center visitor guide. I've got another laptop computer sitting here, a box with phone that I've got to return, a box with a phone that I just picked up. I've got three phones sitting here, a glasses case, a glasses cleaner, a nasal decongestant spray, a coffee cup. You get in the position. There's lots of things that are going to distract me right here in my workspace when I'm trying to do a phone call. Even as you notice, as I was looking around my, 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 my desk, my attention is not on you. My attention is on what's all around me. So I've become absent from that particular activity. So too, you'll tend to become absent from that phone call when all you're doing is looking around at everything else on your desk other than the focus on the call that you're making at the time. 
In the world of video phone calls, particularly, this is really noticeable when people are distracted doing other things. You can sit on a phone call and they're actually working on another screen doing tap, 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 working and they come back. Oh yeah, sorry, what was that? And you know they haven't listened to a word you were saying, even if it's a one-to-one call. It's not a great way to do business and you're gonna get caught out on it eventually. Allow yourself the space and the time and the opportunity to focus in on that call and listen to what the customer has to say. Removing those distractions and actually stepping away to do it. Look, it might be a hard thing to do if you're working from home and your kids are also at home. I don't envy you that at all. That would be like something I find very, very difficult. But if you can do it in some way, shape or form, it will make a big difference in the kind of rapport you're gonna build with your customers, which of course is our next point. Repeat, developing your rapport is where you have a connection that is somehow personal with that particular customer. It's not just you being a business. It's not just you having a big list of products and services that are going to allow you to win the day because you're going to have the product and the service is going to be just right for them. You. Well, that's not quite how it works. What you may need to do along the way is build some kind of connection with the people who you're talking to on the phone. And that's done by taking some notes along the way. A, a, a person's best friend when they're taking phone calls is a pen and paper. They pick up this pencil, this pen, they've got their notepad over here and they start taking notes. They're saying, has kids, lives in Warrandyte, Victoria, um, loves watching Kath and Kim. Uh, so they start to see these references that are coming up so that you can then help to repeat back these facts to them. So you can ask them a question and say, well, first of all, how is the weather in Warrandyte at the moment? Because last time I was there, it was so rainy. And that instant rapport building really helps. That a rapport can be something like they say, oh, they went just went on a holiday to Cairns. And you're saying, well, actually, I went to Cairns last year. Have they still got that, um, that, that lagoon at the waterfront? That was great. The kids love swimming there. That sort of stuff builds a commonality, builds a common point of reference. It builds what we call a rapport. And whilst it may seem like small talk, small talk on phone calls like this is absolutely everything. People are quite fascinated in where you are if they're not in the same city. I'm always fascinated when I get on the phone, I'm talking to someone who's from a different part of Australia. And I'm, I'm fascinated by what it's like there. Like, oh, what's it like living in Adelaide? That's a really general question, but it, it makes them feel like, oh, that person's actually interested in me. They're actually interested in who I am and where I'm at. And if you smile while you're speaking, you probably notice I smile a lot when I'm doing webinars because it's just a habit now. But used to, I used to be quite straight faced when I was doing a webinar. I'd be delivering information and it'd be very dry and I'd look very boring and I wouldn't move much now. I gesture, I gesticulate, I look down the barrel of the gun. I do lots of different things where I use voice techniques that essentially put across that I am enthusiastic about this subject because if someone's not enthusiastic about what they're selling and what they're doing, whew, it becomes an exhausting ordeal to go through because you're just not giving any reason for someone to want what it is that you're trying to sell them. So this is just in a sales call. It could even be in a customer service call. And that certain person calls you to go through what is called a discovery call, where you're trying to find out enough about them to know whether your product or service matches. If you're smiling during that call, it really carries through the phone. It does. It's not just in video calls. It's on audio calls as well. If you're smiling at the same time, there's an effect that happens to your voice, which goes down the phone. They know when you're smiling. I was talking to a friend the other night and, and, and I was kind of like laughing to myself in my head about a story that he was telling me. He said, I can actually feel you smiling down the phone. And it just was a tone of voice I was using that made it so obvious to him that I was actually very entertained by the story he was telling me about a mutual friend of ours. And using your customer's name, if their name is Karen, repeat back. So Karen, what I'd like to do is be able to put you on hold so I can do the next thing. Or, hey, Karen, just so you know, um, I'm listening. I just wanna make sure that I've got this right, that you had the problem on this date, it was with this product and the person you dealt with's name was X. That kind of thing helps to build a rapport because they feel listened to. You bother to listen to their name and repeat it. So often they don't get that in a customer service environment. In really good call center reps, they quite often ask you how they'd like to be addressed. They'll ask you, oh, 
can I call you Dante? Um, yes, Mr. St. James, um, or would you prefer Dante? That, that sort of thing. So I feel more comfortable. I don't like being called Mr. St. James because it sounds like that's my dad's name. That's not my name, <laughs> even though I'm an adult and in middle age. I still don't like being called that. I've got a name. I'd like people to use it. Even in, out of respect, I find that using my name is much more comfortable, but I wouldn't know that. Well, they wouldn't know that unless they actually ask that question and repeat back Mr. St. James to a point where I felt like, oh, just call me Dante. It's much more easy. We're, you know, we're, we're mates now. We're on the phone. Using a customer name is doing that rapport. It allows you to build a connection with a customer that's a very psychological thing. It allows you to feel connected to not just a company or a business. It allows them to connect with you as a human being and allows you to think of them as less, more than just a customer. They're also another human being with problems and issues and loves, hates and passions that you want to help them to achieve in their life through whatever the product or service is that you're trying to bring into their life. One way you also build, develop rapport and continue that understanding is to repeat what your customer's words are, using your customer's terms and colloquialisms for your product or service rather than just your own. Keep things very, very generic when you're describing your product or service, but the minute they call it the phone instead of the mobile, start calling it the phone. If they call it the telly instead of the television, call it the telly. By repeating those words back, you're showing that you're living in their world and understand them and that trust factor goes off the charts they will feel trusted they'll feel like they've been understood and they feel like you are not just the expert in what you do but you understand where they're coming from enough that you're able to present the right solution for them by repeating back what your customer says it shows that you understand so karen you were saying that the problem occurred on the third day after you took the car home is that correct so that's repeating back that she said the problem occurred the third day after the car was taken home Using earlier conversation points later in the conversation is a bit of a context I picked up from comedians. Quite often comedians, um, I saw one Amy Hetherington, who's a territory comedian. She did a show in Alice Springs that I saw and the show is called Don't Feed the Ducks. And the whole time she tells you that this, this whole routine is not about ducks. It's just a random name. But there was a story towards the end of her presentation where she swings on back and tells you a story about the ducks. I won't spoil what it is because it's actually quite hilarious and a little bit morbid as well at the same time. But it was this thing that made everything feel better because we got the context of why the ducks later in there. Now, in, that in the case of your customer, it could be where you've had a conversation point about Adelaide. So that customer happens to be in Adelaide and you've asked them, oh, what's it like in Adelaide today? That's really sad. That's great. Love Adelaide over one of the best places to watch cricket. Now, later on in the conversation, it might be even when you come in or close and saying, look, hopefully next time you get to watch the cricket at Adelaide Oval, you'll be able to do it and not have to worry about the phone reception dropping out, right? It's showing that you listened and cared enough during the conversation that you've actually retained that information and you can bring it back as well. It just makes for a much nicer experience with that customer. But what about when it comes to answering calls? This is really, all that stuff is very much about taking calls and making calls. How about taking better calls when you're answering them? There are techniques that really work well for this, such as answering the call with a greeting, your business name and your name with a call to respond. The example would be, good morning, ABC Building Supplies. I'm Dante. How may I assist you? Not probably a bit more uh, natural than that. I was being a bit of a radio announcer then. But good morning is the greeting. Your business name, ABC Building Supplies. Identifying who you are so they can go, oh, Dante, I spoke to you last week. And then some sort of call to how they want to respond. So if you say, how may I assist you? They go, oh, hi, I, I'm, I'm Kim. I called last week. Um, I'll just return my call to, to Claire. Can you put me through, please? And go, yeah, sure. No worries. I'll do that. So you're giving a clear path, an efficient path through the good morning. You've greeted. You've done the niceties. You've established they've called the right place. You've established what your name is so that they can refer to you if they need to in the future. And you're offering what the next step is, that call to action on how you may be able to assist them. How not to answer a business line is something like, hello? And I've got that before. This morning, one of my first calls was to a distributor of a certain beverage. Now, that beverage um, distributor, their phone line is their business line. They're a small business, but all I did when I called that number, they just went, hello? I'm like, wow, okay, I don't know. So my first thing was, hey, is that Anthony? And he's like, 
oh yeah yeah it's anthony yeah yeah um oh, who's this and it became just this really awkward phone call that just wasn't right so when you're answering a business line be clear about who you are be clear about who they're calling and be clear that you're there to help them remember in the greeting we went um back 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 good morning abc building supplies i'm dante how may i assist you that's clear and very easy to understand. You're being clear about who you are, being clear about who they're calling, that's the company name, and what your next steps are to help them to get that problem solved. When it comes to holding and transferring calls, let them know you're putting them on hold. This is great etiquette for you to take on. Like jot this one down because this is really important. Let them know you're putting them on hold. Be clear why you're putting them on hold and give them an idea of how long you're putting them on hold for. If you say, hey, Karen, I'm just going to put you on hold um, just because I need to go and find to see if there's someone who can actually help you with that inquiry, shouldn't be more than about a minute. That way it's nice and comfortable. It's nice and clear what's going on. They know they're on hold. They'll know why they're on hold and they've got an idea of how long they're roughly going to be on hold, whether they should still hold it up to, their, to the, the phone to their ear or put it down, put it on speaker while they go and start making a coffee or whether it means they can put the baby down. That could be a very real thing in your customers' lives. By handling long hold times, you're able to more effectively handle it when there's lots going on in your business. You don't want to get that position where the person doesn't even know if they're still connected to the call. So check back in regularly when you put someone on hold because a hold of more than one minute is pretty long. Now, that may not feel long. 60 seconds is not a great deal of time in their day, but this person only has a limited time to be able to deal with you. So holding them more than one minute is actually taking a real chunk out of their day. Offer to have them call back if you feel like that hold time is too long. So just make sure if it's going to be more than a minute, check in with them every minute if you can. Say, so I know you're still on hold. Please bear with me just another couple of minutes. Hopefully we'll be able to get that person on the phone for you. And if it takes too long, if that person's not going to come through, say, look, Karen, I'm not having any trouble getting them through. I think their meeting's running over. Can I have her call you back after she gets out of that meeting? That's going to be an infinitely better way of dealing with the whole long hold times than trying to, trying to get someone on hold and keeping them hold for long, long times without them understanding that they're even going to be on hold at all. When transferring to another person, be clear that you're checking to see if that person is available first because you don't want to set up the expectation that they are definitely going to speak to that person in the next 20 seconds. Come back to the customer before you transfer them to the other person and be clear that you're then transferring them now to that person. In the real world, that sounds like... Um, Hi, Karen, Janet is now available. What I'm gonna do is put you through right now and she'll be able to pick up the call at the other end. It'll just ring a couple of times. You're creating expectation of what they'll expect when that transfer happens. Transferring phone calls actually feel like you're going into a weird sort of parallel dimension sometimes with the noises that go on and the rings that happen. And sometimes it bounces around different phones or bounces back to reception. So just be clear. Let me see if Janine's available to take your call. Just put you on hold while I find out I won't be more than half a minute or so. And then when you do the transfer, it's like, I've managed to find Janine. I'm just going to transfer you now. I'll just hold a second and then they'll go through and they'll know exactly where they're coming from. The clear message that we've had in here is to be clear. Lots of clarity, making sure that the person on the other end of the phone understands what's going on. They understand that they're going on hold and they understand the reasons for it. They understand they're being transferred and they've had an expectation set for them of how that transfer will happen. It's gonna make a massive difference to the way that you are able to conduct phone calls and get a good result out of those phone calls as well. So to recap some quick tips before we go, try to speak at least 20% slower than you do in regular conversation when you're on a phone call. Be clear about who you are and why you're calling when you're doing an outbound call to someone. Repeat back the requests and issues from the customer so that they know that you're listening and you are very clear on what the issue is. So when you go to look at a solution or find a person to resolve that, it's very clear what that problem is and where it's going. Also, be focused on the call and not all the things around you. Not the, you know, I've got my little hand sanitizer here. I'm going to rub my hand sanitizer while I'm on the webinar and be distracted by my phone going off over here and the other phone going off. 
just be focused on the call, not all the things that are around you. It's the customer deserves at least that respect. Try to listen without interrupting or attempting the finishing sentences for them because assumptions are the mother of all stuff ups. So if you make assumptions about that customer that they haven't communicated to you, you could be talking to the wrong part of them or offering the wrong solution to them because you didn't listen or take time to understand the context of their life. And understand that sometimes calls don't go great. Sometimes calls will go really well and other calls won't. The consistency factor for you is to understand that sometimes there's skeptics, sometimes people are angry, but overall understand that not every call goes perfect every time. I'd like to thank you for joining me this afternoon. You can contact me through Dante at treaty.com.au or if you'd like to book an ASBAS digital solutions session with myself or any of the other talented advisors, businessstation.com.au. If you do have questions, please, please feel free to send them through to me at Dante at treaty.com.au. Hopefully you've been able to walk away with some ideas on how to better handle the calls you're making and the calls you're taking. And as always, I thank you so much for taking time out of the operation of your business to learn more about how to run your business even better in the future. I'm Dante St. James. Thank you very much for joining me. And I'll join you again on a webinar really, really soon. I'm doing lots of them pretty much every weekday for the rest of this and next month.